It's been a pretty tough year if you've invested in EV stocks. If you look at some of the most popular names in EVs right now, you're seeing substantial declines. Even Tesla, the market leader, the biggest winner is down by half. Then some of the more popular companies out there like Neo, stocks down 64%. Lucid, Rivian are both down close to 80% at this point. I'm Jason Hall. This is The Smattering. I'm joined by Tyler Crow, and we're going to talk about what's going on in the EV space and what investors really need to focus on the three key things going forward. Hey, Tyler. How's it going, Jason? I'm good. So I'm good. I'm excited to be talking about this. I know we can help investors out there. Before we do, thanks to our friends at The Motley Fool. We get to make these videos because of our partnership. If you're looking for some great stock ideas, go to our link, fool.com forward slash the smattering. And the fool is going to give you their 10 best stocks to buy right now. We talked about those stocks. They're getting absolutely smashed. We know they're down significantly, but we also know that the EV industry is massive growth. Let's talk about that before we even talk about any of the stocks. Sure. I mean, the thing that I guess you could say is the, the Holy grail that the EV uh, industry is pursuing is the automotive sale market, which is one of the largest pies of sit like revenue out there uh, for any investor. In 2021 alone, there was $1.7 trillion spent uh, worldwide on, uh, on passenger vehicles. And, you know, the, uh, the large bulk of that came in the traditional combustion fleet. But the expectation is, is that that is going to drastically transition to electric vehicles over the next 10 to 15 years, especially in the passenger vehicle market. And that's why we're seeing companies like Rivian, Lucid, Neo try to get a piece of that pie uh, because there's uh, many of the legacy automakers have been relatively slow towards developing their offerings. And so it made for a, a lucrative North Star that investors could point to and say, if one of these companies can make it and really take off in this industry, there is an immense amount of growth uh, or certainly revenue growth that could be captured. And that's, I think, what people had been kind of pinning a lot of what they've been looking for in this industry. Yeah, there's a there's an interesting stat that you talked about that has been put out there between now and 2050. What's what's the exact number? Yeah, so Bloomberg New Energy Finance says that by 2050, uh, the global EV opportunity is going to be about $53 trillion. Uh, obviously, that is not right now that is uh you know kind of the cumulative over that 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 time this is the 10 largest publicly traded companies this isn't close to all of the automakers in the world and this is ab about one and a half billion dollars in revenue that, that these companies generated over their past four reported quarters is that the industry is very largely consolidated at this point but it seems that the ev companies are looking to disrupt that um and start taking some of that share let's um Let's start. I think it's time to start unpacking this a little bit. And one of the things that you do have to, when you're looking at, you know, the opportunities of revenue and growth versus returns, as as lucrative when you see the revenue of automotive uh, industry, it has not been a great return industry for your investors. Uh, you know, so it's kind of separating out the market opportunity and the investability of the companies. And so one thing that gives me great pause when I, I look at a lot of these things and not to wholly discount everything, but it, it's, it has been a relatively low return industry that has not created a lot of winners over the really, really long term. And so you're betting on low return probability events uh, in this industry. And that's one of the things that certainly when making investments in the sector, I want to be cautious and not over get, get over ambitious with my bets in this industry for that very reason. Because there, if one hits, you have a lot of you could you could really do well, but the probability of that hit happening is still kind of low. Tesla is very much the outlier, and my concern is that a lot of investors looking at EVs and the industry growth are seeing the success of Tesla and looking for the next Tesla. And I've said it before, I don't think there's going to be necessarily another Tesla. So investors should be really careful about that. So I think number one thing I want to say, and this is to emphasize what you were talking about and building on it, is have your expectations aligned 
with what history has shown us. And that's the chance of finding another massive winner in a historically tough industry where you've only ever seen one massive winner is very rare. So I think that's number one. But that doesn't mean there's not going to be opportunity. And talk about some of the things that investors can look for when you're talking about some of these companies. And let's talk about what's it going to take for these companies to be successful. And one thing is we know they're burning a lot of cash as they're trying to scale up and they're going to need to have a strong balance sheet, right? So because a couple of things are going to happen as these companies attempt to build scale, they're going to continue to burn through cash to, as they increase the size of their operations, as they deploy capital, right? So do things like build factories. Now, of course, Rivian and, and Lucid, they're going to be more of the factory building with some partnerships with other manufacturers, um, even though we've seen one of them has backed off of that. Um, their, their deal with Mercedes, they've kind of paused that for right now. And we know Neo is pursuing kind of a, a contract manufacturer strategy, right? Where it's not going to have to outlay necessarily as much capital. But Tyler, we know these are very cash intensive businesses and managing their balance sheet, I think is a really, really important thing. Like we just said, to grow in this industry really fast takes a massive amount of capital. But you know, that, that kind of puts you on a cash burn situation. If you can moderate your growth rates to a level at which, you know, cash generation can be cons sustained, uh, you can kind of build within the comfort zone of your balance sheet where, you know, you have some internal cash flows, you can take on a little bit of debt because your, your business can support it. And that's, that's our third thing is, you know, again, we have the resetting your expectations, number one, number two, managing your balance sheet. And the third part of that is managing your operations when it comes to managing your, your growth pipeline, because the cost of capital, as we've seen, Tyler, has completely changed. Interest rates have gone up substantially, right? That's going to cost a lot more today than it did when these companies went public and were building their case as public companies. And as their stock prices come down, doing things like secondary offerings is another way to raise cash is also far more on a per share basis expensive than it was um, even a year ago. So those are the realities they're managing within. And because they're going to have to deploy capital, even Neo, they're going to have to deploy capital as they continue to grow sales. You're absolutely right. We need to see these companies continue to, to, to manage those parts of their business.